Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. These programs offer an opportunity for us to give you an inside look at exciting topics with musicians, our SLSO administration, and other experts from the music world. I'm Eric Finley, and I'm the Vice President and General Manager of your SLSO. That means I work closely with our musicians, our production staff, our stage crew, the music library, our choruses, our community and education programs, and many more to help bring music into your lives and uh, our community as well. One of my favorite parts of my job is that I also get to work very closely with guest artists, guest conductors, artist agents and managers to put together seasons and the programs and artists involved that make up each season. And this is our topic today, creating a season. Two of the most important leaders in this endeavor are our music director, Stefan Denev, and our CEO, Maria Len Bernard, who we'll welcome shortly. But first, a housekeeping thing, we invite and encourage you to ask questions using the chat function throughout today's conversation. It's at the bottom of the screen. We'll take questions from you throughout the chat and we ask that you please make sure your message is sent to both panelists and attendees so others can see your questions. Ask questions about music, programming, artists, conducting. You can ask us, why'd you program this? Why don't you program that? We welcome your questions and your sharing of ideas. Very importantly, without any further delay, we'd like to extend our sincere thanks to our 2020-2021 Classical Series sponsor, the Stewart Family Foundation. And today's Lunch and Learn is kindly sponsored by Washington University Physicians. Stefan Denev is just concluding his second season with us as music director, and we are all thrilled he's recently extended his contract through the 2025-26 season. In addition to his inspiring artistry, he brings incredible creativity, joy, and good humor to all of his work with the orchestra and with us. And we're delighted today to bring you into this world of creating a season with him and his brilliant programming mind just a bit more. Marie Lynn Bernard, our president and CEO, has been with the SLSO since 2015 and brings not only incredible vision to the programming of our orchestra, but the perspective of having worked at many of the other great orchestras in America over the course of her career. It's a joy to work with a CEO who loves music so deeply and such an imaginative, imaginative and uh, inspiring music director. You'll be spending the next hour hearing the three of us chatting about programming, artists, repertoire, how we create a season, which is not all that unlike from the forum we have for conversations as we approach this blank canvas that is a season calendar and try to bring meaningful and inspiring experiences uh, to you, our audiences, through the programs we share. Uh, before we dig into our conversation, I wanted to share just a bit of, of background and framework for the conversation. Someone asked me on a podcast recently, is programming this sort of triangle of Stefan and Maria Lynn and you at the table putting all of this together? And the answer to that question is that programming involves some sort of geometric shape with many more sides than a triangle. We're certainly guided by Stefan's vision, by Maria Lenz's vision and the vision of our board, but there are many other partners that have a place at the table as we put together this puzzle. One is the musicians and really showcasing their versatility as artists, challenging them creatively, listening to what they are excited to play for you and expanding and nurturing the artistic and community identity of the second oldest orchestral ensemble in our country. Another is the guest conductors and guest artists that we engage, bringing the great artists of the world to St. Louis, their ideas and the repertoire they specialize in. Also at the table are the directors of our resident choruses, the symphony chorus and the in unison chorus and programming repertoire that the chorus or choruses are excited to share with you. And of course, the community is at this programming table as well, our community partners and sharing ideas and collaborations with the great artists and organizations right here in St. Louis. But most important, while you listen to us in concert, we listen to you. Our programming always starts with you in mind, the artists and pieces that you know and love, and the artists and pieces that we think you'll love, but you may not know yet. You, our audience, always has a place at this programming table as we put a season together and we craft year after year programming 
based on the feedback we get from you. So let's dig into our conversation. Please give a very warm welcome to Maria Len and to Stefan. Hi, very good to see you both. Good afternoon. Good and afternoon. Our conversation um, with collaborators, the artists and composers that we work with as it requires some of the earliest planning after we develop initial conceptual visions for a season or sometimes multiple seasons and individual programs. We are always engaging some of the world's most in-demand artists two to three years before our audiences even hear a concert. And if we're commissioning new works of music, often much further out than that. So Stefan, I wanna start with you. You, even before you came to the St. Louis Symphony as music director, you were working with some of the world's great artists, some of whom are now coming to us for residencies or repeat engagements. You've introduced us to some new artists. How do you choose your collaborators? <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, how do I choose my collaborators? Well, uh, there is just a dinner test, and I can see if I can socialize for a full week with them. Uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, there's no dinner test. Actually, it kind of depends because I'm starting to be old, I will reach 50 this year, and I do work uh, today with some soloists I know from the Conservatoire in Paris. Somebody like Renaud Capuçon, Gauthier Capuçon, you know, the brothers, and Nicolas Angelich, the pianist, for instance. I know them since more than 30 years now, and we developed together a long-term relationship. And then, uh, over the years, well, it depends. Sometimes some uh, artistic director, some orchestra says, we would like to have this soloist for the week, we invite you. So do you want to work with this person or not? And uh, uh, it, of course, each time is different. There are some fabulous, you know, uh, revelation and uh, some people that became very, very dear friends. Some people I worked uh, a few times only, some people I worked only once, it always happened. But what I try to do is to keep in contact with the world because there are every year new people arriving and it's very interesting to try to see what new voices arrive and uh, what is important to, uh, to discover. So um, I'm just very open. You helped me, Eric, actually, just telling me, you know, sometimes, oh, I heard this artist is amazing. There are the big competitions uh, that, you know, the Tchaikovsky, the Queen Elizabeth competition in Brussels, the, I don't know, the Van Cleburne in America, for instance. Uh, and we always kind of try to see. And often, uh, the past, let's say, 15 years, I uh, had the chance to uh, try new collaborations during the summer. There are a lot of festivals um, in, in America, which I visit, you know, Tanglewood, Vail, Saratoga, uh, I mean, all, all this Hollywood ball. And uh, uh, I try to actually meet new, new people there. And sometimes it clicks wonderfully, sometimes, you know, less, it's life. And, um, it creates a kind of family of artists that, of course, I, I, I try to, to bring uh, to, to our community, to the SLSO. And I'm so happy that we have some great residency coming, like the one with Nikolai Snyder very soon. And, and Stefan, are you often thinking of repertoire first and then the artist that is best suited for that repertoire, whether it's a new one or, or one that you know um, and have performed a piece with before? or are you often thinking of the artists and their reputation first and then the repertoire comes later? It does depend who, which artist it is, who it is, because some artists are so in demand and you really want them. So basically you try to get uh, a week with them and sometimes you have to book in advance, like three years in advance. And then uh, they sometimes say like, well, I'm sorry, I can only offer this repertoire. They offer a few concertos and uh, you're happy if it fits with what you wanted to do. Sometimes, so you adjust to, uh, to, to their need. Sometimes um, you can influence that. And, and yes, I often think about the, the, the repertoire that is the best for, for an artist. Um, like there will be a new, um, a new collaboration uh, next year, which is with uh, Vikingo Olafsson, and uh, he will bring uh, a, a concerto of, of Greek, for instance, which really, uh, will um, will fit, you know, his his, uh, his his world, and I think it's fantastic to do that with him, for instance. And Marilla, I'd like to ask you, you know, you you worked at the Philadelphia Orchestra, you worked at the Cleveland Orchestra, 
um, you, you've had this incredible perspective with some of the great ensembles of the world, seeing artists come through, and there's just so much talent in our world these days. What brings your attention to an artist these days? Is it is it reputation? Is it press? Is it an agent? What? It's a variety of factors, and one thing that that we all very are very proud of at the St. Louis Symphony is that this orchestra, being the second oldest in the country, has launched many careers. And there's an interesting phenomenon in St. Louis, and I don't know if it's because St. Louisans are not concerned about the world looking at what we're doing, unlike, unlike let's say, New York, that this institution, if I go back 50, 60, 70 years, launching artists, uh, premiering composers that were lesser known, uh, this also has a remarkable history of, of really giving a chance to basically very emerging artists or unknown artists. Um, so we're very proud of that, and I want us to continue that tradition. There's always a certain risk involved. For me, reputation is never the, the driver. I'm much more interested in the voice of an artist, the uniqueness. And as Stefan mentioned, we can never predict how an artist is going to mesh artistically with a conductor, whether it's Stefan or a guest conductor. So there's always kind of a certain amount of risk if it's someone that, that Stefan or, or others have not worked with. But it's also their job, is that Stefan is a beautiful accompanist will you know adjust and embrace the style of an artist and and really make make the experience the best possible but there is great chemistry that happens that we can't predict so it's a mix of everything i mean i rely of course on the research that you and your team are doing on my own research which now sadly i don't have as much time as i used to have to listen and but i love i love a good gossip so i'm always online looking for what people are saying about different things i i don't necessarily go by reputation meaning that it's not because another major orchestra has booked an artist that i i i think we should book them i think for me the music making is is a driver so it's a mix of all of what we discussed earlier and you're right, Mayelin, that uh, in my dressing room, I have actually, uh, uh, in the <laughs> power hall, I have all the season programs since more than a century. Yeah. And I love to uh, go into it. And it's fascinating. Basically, the entire musical world has been on this stage. Like yeah. all the best yeah. names you can imagine, they have been there. And so I'm glad that we continue this tradition, inviting really the top, yeah. the top of the top. And and lastly, you know, I always put things in four categories. One very important is we love to feature our players. I think we have phenomenal performers in, in our orchestra. No one, not everyone, you know, wants to have solo opportunities, but every year we craft opportunities for our players um, to perform with Stefano Gas. And, and the other categories are, you know, relationships we've had for decades, that artists we bring back, new soloists we don't know, and then a mix of people Stefan brings and, and guest conductors bring because they want to introduce new people to us, but it's less of a risk because they've worked with them. So it's really a vast array of amazing talent. And as you know, it's not as easy to get to St. Louis as it is to get to LA or New York. And one of the finest pianists and, and soloists and singers in the world traveled to work with the St. Louis Symphony on our stage. So I think I want us to, to continue to to remember that we have as many great soloists as the New York Field Boston Symphony of Cleveland Orchestra. And I think we're very proud of nurturing this extraordinary talent, local, but also from around the world. It's true. I think a lot of that is also just how sensitive the orchestra is as, as, uh, as collaborators and this, this versatility that you're talking about, the fact that we, we feature them as soloists, as chamber musicians, as you know they love performing with with soloists. They're not they're not waiting for the concerto to end to get onto the symphony. They they love these collaborations. So it's so true. This uh, incredible history that this orchestra has of ushering in careers um, over many many decades. I'm curious for each of you. I think it's a little different for everyone. Do you have an aha experience whenever you you know you're hearing something or someone really special? Or is it something you come to slowly over the course of hearing someone a couple of times? Stefan, what, what's it like for you? Uh, for me, I have to say it's, it has to be a, a, a love at first sight. Um, I need to just uh, feel something special. The uniqueness, as you said, for me is very important. And also today, 
I, I think on top of, of course, the highest musical level, there is an element of um, generosity of, um, of somebody who care for the world and has views. And uh, um, I think I really need this kind of personality that I know we can expand our collaboration and do sometimes also some work with the community, some outreach. So um, this is very, very important. Last year, we should have had Nicola Benedetti um, uh, as an artist in residence. And she's, for instance, a wonderful violinist who also has a lot of activities in the uh, teaching, in, in, in actually uh, working with um, uh, a different aspect of, uh, of the community. And, and, and I, I, I'm sorry that we didn't have her, but she will be back and we'll, uh, we'll work with her in the, in the next years, as you know. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I love it when I have a certain perception of an artist before I heard them because of publicity or what I hear. And then they completely transform that impression when they perform with us. And that's a beautiful moment for me. And every time, never judgeable by, by the cover, right? But it's it's some artists just do really, you know, take my breath away because I said, I never, I never thought that of, you know, that this could, could, could be happening. And also artists, and I know very well that I've heard over the years who continue to really impress me with their continued exploration and how they challenge themselves as artists to really shape a musical experience that, you know, technicality is admired, but at the end of the day, is how as artists they will give us an interpretation that <gasps> and there is one aspect which is great news is that um a lot of good new music is composed today mm -hmm. and the good effect of that is that a lot of great soloists now are associated with some composers mm -hmm. and uh, and it's so fantastic because then you 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 really have this uh, exciting new concerto that come with a soloist who premiered it and, uh, and, and for me, this is really uh, essential. Kirill Gerstein with Thomas Hades, for instance. You know, uh, you have uh, um, Dela Josefovic with John Adams. You know, you have this really great partnership that, uh, that bring uh, 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 the full package for me, which is a, a, a new piece as their own talent. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned this, Stefan, because there's a wonderful question uh, in the chat actually about new work. And, and let's all remember that pieces like the Korngold Concerto were premiered in St. Louis. And this was a new work at one time. Um, you know, Beethoven was new work at one time. So uh, I would like to hear, because you have a really, you have, a, I think, a unique approach and a unique um, aesthetic for new music. What are you looking for when you're selecting music of our time and, and nurturing relationships with composers? I'll be very selfish first. I believe I cannot conduct well a music I don't love. So what I look for is that first, I'm passionate about it, that I really believe and love this music. So I go to the piano and I play it and I, I try to feel my own connection. And to have this connection, I need actually a music that has a lyrical aspect, that has a narrative aspect, that bring a clear emotion uh, on the table. So. Uh, for me, as, as you know now, since uh, a, a few years that I started, uh, we can say that, uh, it's very exciting to say that I've been here for a few years now. Um, uh, I, I really actually uh, want to share my passion for new works and, 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 and I do select pieces that I believe can not only please the audiences, the musicians first, you know, the orchestra, but our audiences and can stand the test of time. And uh, that is also very important. I, I believe we need to always create the repertoire of the future. And so we need to nurture this repertoire with pieces that I believe are masterworks. And uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I, I, I try all the time. I'm, I spend a lot of time actually um, more than maybe a lot of people really just listening to new music. We have listening session together, uh, you know, with you, Eric, with Jan, with Marilyn. We, we, uh, we, we actually just uh, uh, try to discover new things. And, uh, and, and, and for me, the, what I look for is really this lyrical emotion. I love tunes. I love melodies. I love just warm music that take me on a journey, emotional journey.
I love that. And you you wed these works that we discover so beautifully with uh, music that's been around for, you know, decades and, and, uh, and centuries, of course. Um, mm -hmm. The wonderful question in the chat also about um, conductors and nurturing conducting talent and how we select uh, conductors is a major aspect of putting together a season. Um, Maria Lynn, would you just talk a little bit as the person who hired Stefan Venev, mm -hmm. um, would you talk a little bit about the, the importance of building relationships with conductors and, and your mm -hmm. philosophy about approaching that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a question in the chat about whether we would continue to foster more more talents in the podium, more women conductors, and the answer is absolutely. Uh, Gemma Nu was our uh, resident conductor for a few years, and she continues as a guest, and now Stephanie Childress. And if you look at the fall season we announced uh, last week, you're going to see other uh, established emerging talents. Um, I think for me, great artists and great music is not uh, based in gender. So I think as a society, when we reach a point where we embrace the diversity, uh, so what I've uh, we're, we're looking at in in fostering and, and nurturing relationships with guest conductors is people who bring a different different palette. Uh, that is uh, complementing Stefan's, but also leadership talent is very important and how you develop the talent. And, and Stefan is in his own right, a truly great uh, at nurturing um, talent. So his work with Gemma and now with Stephanie and others will be truly impactful for the industry for years to come is that conductors learn by conducting orchestras, right? And working with administration, with people like us, understanding the various dynamics of what it takes to be a music director. It's a complex role. It's not just about programming and getting an podium and, and conducting an orchestra. It requires very fine leadership skills and it's a lifelong pursuit. I think Stefan, you could speak of that for hours. The fact that the conductor you are today with repertoire you've done for 30 years, you continue as a human being to approach it differently. And because as a human being, you change, you evolve. You So I think it's never a, a, a static um, effort. So for us, and it's true of any talent at the St. Louis Symphony, whether it's in the orchestra, with the way that's on staff or the board, and it's true of conductors, is how do you think long-term and, and continuously involve new talent and nurture it and give the best you have. It may benefit us, it always benefits us, but it might benefit others. So I think having the very long view of five, 10 years, and, and we're seeing now, five years ago, it was a little different. Sometimes we get into cycles where talent is more rare. And, and Eric, I think you can speak to that, whether it's composing or conducting. Sometimes there are gaps in generations that we see right now. I think that the field is flourishing with talent. I'm very excited. I would say in my 25 years in this business, right now is a time where I find so many resources and so much um, coming our way and so many exciting talents. I don't know, Stefan, if you share that view, but I think we are just entering a very exciting phase of our uh, creative life as organizations. And as I agree with that. And I, lo I love that this organization is also trying to uh, play a role as, as you speak to Maria Lynn in and really broadening that pipeline of mm -hmm. talent that is coming yeah. into our field yeah. as well. Yeah. It's not yeah. just nurturing what's already out there, but 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 really broadening that as well. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of great questions that I want to answer here really quickly as we kind of pivot again. Uh, there's a question about local composers, and mm -hmm. I'm very excited to um, to talk just a bit about um, you know the Pulitzer series being. Um, really a wonderful part of what we do at the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and Tim Monroe's uh, curating of that series. Tim featured um, in a program that will actually be rescheduled now, uh, all Missouri composers um, on a Pulitzer program. And actually there's someone uh, as well that we have commissioned um, that lives just an hour and a half away. I won't share a name just yet that we have a commission coming down the pipeline for our New Year's Eve concert and um, that we'll announced in September. So certainly nurturing uh, local and regional um, talents uh, as we feature the orchestra as soloists, for example, is very important in our relationship with composers as well. 
And mm -hmm. I also want to answer while we were on the, we were on the topic of conductors. There's a great question here about Great American Orchestras trading conductors for a week. And in fact, this is what we do. Uh, we we Stefan goes and conducts. We we trade him and uh, and uh, really benefit from him carrying the St. Louis Symphony name in other places whenever he conducts all around the world. And uh, we have many conductors come to St. Louis that. Uh, have deep relationships with orchestras of their own as well. So really great question there. And I think it's one of the things that really nurtures creativity in our field is uh, conductors awareness of working with different ensembles and the sounds of different ensembles as well. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that, uh, just to be clear, it's never organized as an exchange, of course. Right. It's not, no, it's true. Not. You know, you come and I come. This, this is not at all how it works. It's just that <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm visiting some great orchestra of this country. I mean, uh, uh, I was principal guest conductor in Philadelphia and, and, and I, I'm going regularly to the New York Philharmonic, to the Cleveland Orchestra, Los Angeles Philharmonic, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and, and we invite, of course, uh, other conductors who happen to be uh, great music directors in other orchestras. And, and this is very healthy that, uh, that we can uh, travel the world. And I always feel really that is important for our musicians too, because they play their entire career sometimes with only one orchestra and um, in the, the same acoustic. And so it's very important that we can, uh, conductors from all over the world, assess actually what they are doing in comparison with other acoustics, with other orchestras, and, uh, and sometimes bring some, um, you know, other point of view or aspects. Uh, so this is a, a great melting pot, I think. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that, Stefan. Yes, Stefan's not a free agent, anyone. So we're married to him, so he doesn't. You know, he stays married to us. We. <laughs> That's right. There's no trade. There's no trade. <laughs> um, I'd love to pivot to talk just a little bit about moving on from artists to talk a little bit about repertoire, Stefan. Your mm -hmm. philosophy as it relates to to the repertoire that makes up our programs and 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 how we select this um, when we really start thinking about a season and initial concepts, where do you begin? What's the first thing you think about? Uh, is, it, is it works in, 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 in um, individual programs, real works that you really want to do, or does it start with something bigger that maybe spans a larger period of time? I love that you pretend to ask this question where you know very well. Because <laughs> we well think, I was supposed to ask that question, actually. How do you, uh, how do you, you think both start? ways, actually. You're, <laughs> you're very good at Actor Studio to uh, embrace, of course, the community in your question. Uh, but I will answer everybody um, that, that indeed, um, well, actually, there is uh, for me a feeling of zeitgeist. We, and more and more, I feel like that. More and more, I feel like there is the, the, the spirit of the time, there is the feeling of the world. And I think an orchestra is really a, a model of society that should interact and hopefully, I hope, propose the best of society, show that we can be all different and bring beauty when we are really together. And so I love that more and more now, uh, orchestras actually are really not in their ivory tower, just performing, you know, uh, the masterworks and that's it. They just think about how to connect with the community, with uh, everybody, with the different uh, uh, expectations from the audiences. And so uh, it became maybe more kind of political, it's maybe a big word, but more uh, uh, social than ever um, to, uh, to, to make a, a full season. And, and we, I mean, look, my very first season was centered into this idea of uniting the French and the American culture to make an arch between them. And the second season, as it should have happened, was very much about uh, elevating some voices and trying to see how we can rebalance the different voices to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to actually show that there are uh, some unknown repertoire, some unknown uh, uh, voices that needs to be discovered or rediscovered. And, um, and, and during the COVID time, we spent our time programming and reprogramming, actually. And so <laughs> in a very quick pace, we had to try to see what could uh, speak, actually, to, uh, to, to the spirit of the, of the time. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I love that. So, so first, there is a feeling that I need always to know more 
the St. Louis community to uh, uh, interact always more, which I will do uh, in the future uh, uh, to, to just, and, and we have a lot of meeting with uh, different uh, art form uh, representant, I mean, some, some art director from theater companies, from dance companies, uh, from, from art de designer or artists, uh, visual artists, and, and we, we are together trying to, uh, to create this, uh, this awareness of, um, of, of what is there and how we can build on all this richness. Um, so that's the first thing. Then uh, there, there is, of course, some big works that I dream to do. And uh, uh, we have many lists, actually. We have lists of composers we would like to commission, we would like to work with. And uh, you're very good, by the way, Eric, at, at making that very properly done. We have beautiful documents, Excel documents with big lists. We have a list of pieces that um, we want to do at some point. And um, we have the piece, for example, the list of the pieces that were canceled by COVID that we want to reprogram at some point. Um, we, we, so we, uh, we have also um, so the list of, of soloists. And then uh, what, what happened is often you have to book the very, very, very in demand, very top star soloists as soon as possible. And that create with their availability some already mapping of the season. So that's always help. And then for me, all the art is to, um, uh, of programming is, is to imagine, to just try to balance a full season with repertoire that will speak to everybody. So we have another list, which is fascinating. We have a, a, a big list of repertoire played, like for instance, uh, the 30 last years, I can see right away um, how many times this symphony has been played. And so we, we kind of think, okay, that has been a very long time since we played this, this piece. It's really a masterwork that should come back. So we make a list of the pieces that should come back. And then we try to you know, in, interact with all the ideas and try to see how suddenly everything makes sense. It's a big jigsaw puzzle. And it's sometimes very frustrating because you, you build a fantastic program, but then, ah, the right artist that would be perfect is not free that week. So you try to, you know, change and move. And it's a, it's a very dynamic process uh, for sure. But my, my, my philosophy is that a great program should always have uh, something that is a new vision of a very famous piece, of a very big um, master work that is somebody that people can you know, come and, 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 and feel good because they, they, they know it, but also some rare pieces of the repertoire and some new pieces. And uh, that's why I, I really advocate for, for two part concerts where, where we have the time to, uh, to create this dialogue between the different pieces and, uh, and obviously doing the right bouquet for me, which is always with, um, with indeed uh, uh, some rarities with some new pieces and, some very famous pieces all together. If that is a well done with a, with a very nice narrative, uh, with a meaningful association of the pieces, then we can have a, a great evening. And, and Eric, as, as Stefan explains how he approaches programming, when you start with your team and Stefan, you start with a really blank canvas. And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit you know, from a practical standpoint, the other components that you think about when you approach Stefan with shaping a season, because it starts with him, tell us a little bit more about other practical considerations as the head of artistic planning that you have to keep in mind. Sure, I, and I think this is the this is the one of the fun challenges. I think uh, it, it's only fun for so long. The the surprises are not as fun, but whenever they're the challenges that you know about, they're really fun to try to navigate some of this because. It involves thinking about and paying attention to, as Stefan uh, points out, when the last time was that we played a work. And someone in the chat mentioned that, you know, some works, how often we choose to, to bring back works. And we'll often try to, when we bring back a work, bring it back with a different conductor so the audience can have a different experience with it. So that's, that's one thing that we think about. Um, we're often thinking about the stage moves and mm -hmm large percussion forces of a work and what that requires in the room, not only on the stage, but sometimes backstage. Um, for example, programs that have chorus and whether or not it's practical to also have pianos or a piano soloist on a program that also has 
chorus or a very large percussion detail on stage. And then from week to week, one of the things that I think takes some experience and awareness and knowledge of the repertoire is also taking care of our musicians as well, because it's much like um, the way a baseball team is uh, balancing out their schedule, their travel schedule, and you know how much a pitcher is used, or uh, when someone gets a day off, that there's certain repertoire that's very demanding for some instruments. And if we scheduled it week after week after week, it would, uh, would be very challenging. So we have to think about keeping our people healthy too, and uh, pr providing just that right amount of challenge for the orchestra and certain sections of the orchestra without doing too much as well. And then the other thing, uh, Maria Lynn, that comes to mind is also um, paying attention to our subscription series. Everybody has their different evenings and different packages that, that they like to come to the orchestra. And it may be that a soloist or uh, a piece appeared on the Friday series one time, and we want it to uh, uh, appear on the Sunday series or the coffee series the, the next time it comes back to really make sure that year in, year out, that everyone is getting to really experience the variety of programming and artists that we have at the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And you try to not repeat too much of the same programming from weekend to weekend, you try to vary and that's a, that's hard. Like occasionally we step back. So if we look at, you know, we, when we issued a press release, we always organize at the end the calendar also by composers, by artists. And we were very careful about offering a diversity of programming and not repeating ourselves too much. And I know sometimes uh, audiences want to see pieces back sooner. We are trying to spread, uh, not to repeat ourselves from season to season. And sometimes it's hard because there's music that's beloved that people want to hear sooner. And yet we stretch the time we bring it back. And as Stefan said, it's, it's amazing to go back to the list of everything we've performed in the last 140 yeah. years and realize that some great works have not been played in 10, 15 years. I mean, Stefan, just last year alone. Yeah, uh, and I can't wait, by the way, also for our choruses uh, to be back with us as well, because a lot of the yeah. big event pieces include uh, choruses. Like, for instance, I can't wait to go back to do a opera in concerts, you know, we were supposed to do Turandot of Puccini mm -hmm. uh, when uh, our season la last year, we had, I mean, some really very special uh, pieces like Joan of Arc uh, uh, with actors and singers and something that was really a, a very good, very fantastic event. And I love this festive aspect. Uh, if I could, I would do a permanent f festival, like festivals with themes and linked weeks together who have, uh, you know, integral of this. So um, for sure, I, 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 uh, I think it's very important to, uh, to, to create something that has a narrative and, uh, and, and bring your curiosity, because this is the most important emotion before attending a concert is to be curious about what the program will be and uh, what those pieces together will be. It's like a great menu, it, uh, you have to salivate. Yeah, and Stefan, as we just announced the fall, and we will re-announce the full season just just right after Labor Day, so no worries, there's a full season in the making. Uh, um, Louise is asking whether you would do a Q a with the audience um, before the season begins so you can talk about uh, the programming for the fall, and today we don't have time to dive, to do a deep dive into programming, but Eric, this is something we plan to do at a future Lunch and Learn, yeah. to really showcase every program and, and, and kind of whet your appetite, you know, the audience's appetite, and see about the, the gems and also the things that Stefan um, cares deeply about and what's, uh, what's to be expected this fall. There's a question also in the chat that I just love uh, from Louise, which is uh, with the music you love, do you most often love it from the beginning or are there pieces that had to sink in for you to love Ooh. and embrace it? Is this is a to hear you answer that question. This is a very, very, very good question. And I always uh, feel very cautious about new music because it's very easy to take a new piece uh, like this, by the way, that's a new piece uh, that I'm doing next week, and to say like, uh, ah, ah, that's okay. Actually, you do have to understand that some pieces need 
a certain mental process to be appreciated. And it depends of, of your own uh, uh, bringing your own test. Um, for instance, there are some pieces of Richard Strauss. Could you imagine Richard Strauss? I mean, it should be like, you know, I should be falling in love with every piece right away. Yet it took me some time to fully appreciate some of, um, of his music. And there are still some pieces which I'm sure are great which I don't yet understand very well, like Sinfonia Domestica. I have some friends, conductors, some colleagues and friends who say, oh, you don't do the Sinfonia Domestica of Strauss. It's such a great piece. And uh, I'm like, uh, I don't feel it yet. But mm -hmm. in this case, it's very clear that it's me, the problem, not, not the piece. So it, it will take time. So yes, sometimes uh, uh, you, can, you cannot appreciate it right away. And that's why it's very important, by the way, for some of the most passionate of you to come to more than one concert of the same program. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and there was a question also, and Eric, you can elaborate on this with Stefan, is like, what has changed in programming? And Susan earlier, one of the first questions in the chat said, why do we always often uh, program the new piece in the first half, right? So, you know, this kind of approach that, oh, you do the new piece in the program, so you have to wait till intermission and after to hear that. So tell us a little bit about that because we like to break break things apart. Well, yes, definitely. I love to, 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 to change and sometimes to do, of course, concertos in the second part of the concert or to mix. And luckily, um, uh, she's, she's right that uh, what happened, let's, let's be very honest, is that often the modern piece has been was the hard piece to get and the one that people will maybe not appreciate right away and we kind of knew it and and sometimes these pieces have been programmed for the wrong reason uh, just because you had to and for the commission but not really for the right love of of the piece itself so yes it was sometimes easier to uh, to swallow the pill at the start of the dinner and then to uh, enjoy the dessert. Um, this is changing. And so many of our concerts will, will actually uh, uh, feature now pieces indeed in every part of, um, of, of the program. And we are thinking about that, about when to, uh, to do things. And things are changing. For instance, uh, there is one idea which I'm very excited about. Um, this fall, we, we have a, a concert where we do in the first part of the concert, three pieces. Um, uh, back to back without interruption. So we'll do uh, Entracte by Caroline Shaw, mm -hmm. followed by uh, uh, the unanswered question of uh, Charles Ive, which is an old piece, and then Rapture uh, by Christopher Rouse. And I, I, I simulated, of course, not only in my mind, but just listening uh, to the piece, the, 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 the continuation, the tonality, the last chord of the piece and the atmosphere. And I do believe, I hope I'm right, that those three pieces together can create a very special journey, which is a new piece in itself, a kind of imaginary symphony. And so I will ask the audience, as I speak at the beginning of the concert, to say like, please do you mind to refrain from uploading after the two first pieces, because I would like to make those three pieces one journey together. And, uh, and, and I love that now we can try to make these things during the COVID time. We did a, a program where we played the Metamorphosis of Strauss followed without interruption by a piece by Yoshimatsu, a recent piece called And Birds Are Still. And um, I thought it was really a fascinating process to go from one piece to another and to answer the questions of the Metamorphosis of Strauss in a way he could not have imagined, thanks to another composer today. And so uh, this is some new tools, I would say as well, that I want to bring. And yes, hopefully, uh, uh, the great pieces of our time can be played in any part of the concert and not only at the very beginning. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, a, a very good question. And I think a lot of it also has to do with just output at this mm -hmm. time there are more composers writing short works right now. Yep. And yep. Um, I don't know if that speaks to something about perceptions of attention span or perception mm -hmm. of, of that programming, instead of having a symphony with multiple movements, as Stefan describes, we're building our own little symphonies of works that are interrelated or connected to one another. But what I love about it is the shorter works allow for more creativity. As Stefan has described before, it allows for more of an opportunity to 
to construct these bouquets, for example, yeah. on a, on like, a in, like in restaurants, like in restaurants. Yeah. If, if you go to Bullrush near Powell Hall, you will have a menu with I think 15 dishes, and yeah. you would say, okay, in the good old times, you had like a, you know three course menu or something, and the idea is kind of the same. It's just that. Uh, people are now part, are part of a global world and they want to uh, kind of experience big, big journey, big travel. And, uh, and I think that this, this feeling of uh, trying to, um, uh, yes, to, uh, to, to show you uh, some different paths thanks to uh, 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 shorter pieces. And, and that's what it is today, for yeah. sure. And, and obviously in the industry, there's a lot of talks about committing to commissioning but we want to commit to playing the pieces over and over again and shorter mm -hmm. will have greater chances to be programmed for obvious reasons and someone in the chat asked about the cost of programming that do we make decisions occasionally that are driven by budget consideration and yes this is the very eternal conversations we have <laughs> that we'd love to do six operas a year with you know but um, but yes. there are some works that there are some works that require extensive percussion section or extensive and you know Stefan when you did the Alpine Symphony I will never forget this was just I think before you had just been appointed but you know it's a very large work that commands very large forces so budget definitely comes into play is that Eric has a, a budget and he's really great uh, at uh, uh, respecting it but it means that he needs to finesse the balance of you know, artists who command higher fees of programming, cost of programming, and also um, nurturing Stefan's great vision. And <laughs> we do have to make decisions about not doing things or substituting things so that it's a, a lot more affordable. Is that I, a answer, I, I need to pay. I need to pay an homage, though. I need to pay an homage to uh, <laughs> to the marketing department and to you because in my past I've heard a few times from some orchestras, uh, you know saying, oh my God, this is very audacious program, very daring program with whatever. And uh, yes, the audience will love it, both of them. Uh, and uh, uh, meaning that, of course, this program will be hard to sell. And at the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, David Nifschitz always take a few seconds before answering me when I say like, what do you think about this program? And he really uh, led us quite free to dream programs without saying right away, nope it's too difficult to sell. Um, so we are in a good place. I must say, I feel great. If you look at our programs, I think uh, kind of every program, I think, uh, has at least one or two pieces from today. And we dare to do that because I think the, the world is changing and I feel that the audience is with me uh, to understand that my own choices of music is a music that they really may well love, plus the pleasure of discovering something new. So that um, you know, this should not be a, a repeller or something that would make people not come. So uh, that's good news. And there will be always a balance. There will never be concert with just new music or just you know. It just it has for me always to be the right elegant balance between the different ingredients. And you know that that balance, you know, like everything in life, just uh, so important. That's true. We think about it with everything that we do. Really, it's at the forefront of all of our thinking. Yeah. I want to bring uh, our audience's um, attention to something that you have, Stefan, that I think is really unique. As you talk about, um, you know, building this bouquet and um, and storytelling and narrative in your programs, Stefan has something on his website that very few conductors have which is something called Concerts Archive. Visit Stefan's website and you can see all of the Steph all of the programs that Stefan has built and conducted with many different orchestras around the world all the way back to 2006. Um, and it, it's another thing that for me, when you started, it brought me into your world a bit and into your mind a bit about how you how you think about programs. Um, I, I more than one. 1200 concerts imagine since 2006 amazing amazing <laughs> plenty to choose from there plenty plenty of repertoire to choose from so i wanted to ask you you know as i look at those i think about the things that you would say to us or to the audience about these programs and you know i love that louise points out the 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 educative element um in presenting music and that you talk to the audience at the beginning of every one of your programs, 
Is this something you think about the way you're going, going to introduce these programs when you're crafting them? Um, not entirely because um, I usually decide about what I say the afternoon of the first concert. You know that, you know, sometimes I ask you, I say like, is there an aspect that I should not forget to, uh, to communicate? And I really go with the flow, if I may say, to just try to feel how I want to, uh, to, 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 to interact with the audience and what I want to say to, uh, to ignite their uh, uh, active listening, basically. I just want to ignite this expectation and curiosity. So this I decide quite late, but it is true that when I, I create a program, I always try to, um, to make sense. Normally, normally, there should never be a program where there's not uh, a reason a piece is paired with another. And uh, sometimes it can be quite abstract. Uh, it can be sometimes just very artistic, if I may say, like each piece, uh, I imagine it as a little planet. So you have big planet, you have small planet, depends on the length sometimes, and you have the different atmosphere, the color of the planet, the, uh, the distance to the sun. And, uh, uh, and, and I love to imagine those, those pieces, you know, interacting with each other. And, and sometimes it's just that, it's just, I'm curious to see how you would enjoy this piece after the other uh, and uh, how it will influence. But very often, though, it's more than that. Very often, it's indeed, you know that because we discuss forever. It's just, um, you know, like what piece can really um, uh, uh, have the right, the right meaning uh, and the right connection. And, uh, and yes, of course, at the end, this helps me tremendously to, um, to communicate about the program and to... Uh, uh, and to make it, I hope, uh, something attractive. Mm -hmm. And Eric, have you talked to um, about a little bit about your work with musicians? You have an artistic committee that gives you feedback. Do you want to elaborate on a, a bit on this before we do a last round of questions? Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, first I have to say the really the culture of of how we interact with the musicians is something that I was introduced to. Uh, immediately upon coming to the organization, mm -hmm. first of all, in opening up some season brochures, I went, wow, it's incredible how much the musicians are featured as soloists throughout this program. Mm -hmm. um, just on a regular basis, it's been a part of the culture here and something that um, is just such a joy to continue. Mm -hmm. But also, I think the greatest gift that I've ever been given as a, as a, as a programmer was what you did, Maria Lynn, whenever I uh, was just starting, which was to mm -hmm. say the whole orchestra about mm -hmm. what they wanted to play and what their mm -hmm. memorable performances were during their tenure and mm -hmm. what they thought was missing, you know, yeah. uh, those ingredients that they wanted mixed into our, our, our menu. And yeah. um, it was, it's just been this treasure trove for every year that uh, we've sat down and talked about seasons to be able to to call upon that information that our, our music, musicians generously generously gave us um, yep. early yep. on. And we'll yep. do that again. Yep. Uh, I think we should do that again. And but we survey know, our audience quite frequently as well to, yep. to hear from them. And that's something we listen to. We listen to our audience, to our community. And hey. as you are still newer with us, has started to meet more local artists and just asking, you know, what are the things we can do together? How help me think about different ways that I can think about a programming that can include and feature our local artists. So that's been an interesting uh, conversation, Stefan. At the end, it is really for the audience that we play, we like to share, we like to hear, uh, you know, a warm uh, applause. So it's really directed to you. And I, I mean, Eric and you, Marianne and I, we, we take this programming aspect very seriously. I would say it was number one. For me, let's imagine, it's like you have the, an immense library with all the book of the world in every language, right? And then a season means basically that I, at the end, decide the only hundred books you'll be able to read because a piece only exists when it's played. So basically this is insane when you think what responsibility that I, I, I have to reduce, you know, millions of pieces, millions of books basically to just a hundred books that I will say, you can read this one now, it's, it's for you. And, um, and so this is 
ultra important. And I think, uh, you know, with the, the marketing department, they analyze always how many people came for each concert. So to see what works, what doesn't work. And I would encourage all our audiences to communicate, to just be interactive, just right. send, a, send an email, send whatever, a little text, just to say which piece you like, what you, what you didn't, what you want to hear again, because this is actually my role. I want to always more understand who you are, what you love, and that we try to uh, find indeed the, 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 the pieces that we all love together and that we can celebrate. So it's all your participation for me is a treasure. Yeah, and, and Jim is asking in the chat, what is a constructive way for us, the audience, to make suggestions and participate other than just calling our favorite compositions? You know, it's, it's that. I mean, it's, there's no other way other than for you and just understanding that occasionally, yeah, you cannot do everything. Oh, no. Occasionally, we might not do the piece you want to hear for a variety of reasons that um, have nothing to do with the, the quality of the artistic merits um, of, a, of a piece. Yeah. Um, yeah, Eric, one last thing. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. we're out of time soon, but there was several questions about continuing our digital platform and, and the right. answer. Yes, we will continue. And shaping an interesting platform, we're still exploring with all of you. The Pulitzer season will be announced later this summer and we're still talking to them about the uh, uh, returning to a live performance versus digital only. It's probably gonna be a mix for a little while. We're still in transition. As you know, the, there's been a lot of uh, lifting of restriction in the, our local community regarding the pandemic, the COVID, but still, we want to be respectful of the fact that uh, the entire community is like transitioning to a new way of uh, experiencing music and socializing. So there's going to be a lot of developments over the summer. And again, the full season will be announced in August. What you receive on June 10th was an announcement of the fall season, but rest assured that the rest of the season is coming and is already planned. Uh, just We're just waiting for restriction to lift further as the city is allowing us 50% uh, audience capacity in September. We are expecting this to change. So we wanna be back to full capacity in order to announce the full season. So we'll hear from us many times um, this summer. Well, thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Stefan. Um, just always a pleasure to talk and dream uh, about these future seasons and um, indeed, we may be having a conversation in the future about how we plan digital seasons as well. So um, before we wrap up, we also want to thank again the Stewart Family Foundation and Washington University Physicians for their very generous support. And thank you for joining us for your wonderful questions, most of all for your love and support of the SLSO. Uh, finally, I want to share some quick information about um, the SLSO as we wrap up the final two weeks of our 2020-2021 season. Uh, we'll be taking a short break from hosting Lunch and Learns for the summer, but anticipate we'll be back with more in September as we start the 21-22 season. As always, check your inbox for an invitation later this summer. And next Thursday evening, June 24th, join us for our final orchestral concert of the season, Operatic Encore with the SLSO. We'll celebrate the conclusion of our season and our partnership with Opera Theater of St. Louis with overtures, intermezzi, and other great highlights from the operatic repertoire and bid you farewell until the fall. In addition to a few more performances with Opera Theater this week, we're also bringing music to you and the community with SLSO on the go. These short concerts are performed by small ensembles of musicians throughout the metropolitan area. We have concerts on Juneteenth at the Jewish Community Center and at Forest Park coming up. For more details, visit slso.org slash on the go. Thank you again, Maria Lynn. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, our audience, for joining us. And we hope to see you next Thursday evening at Powell Hall or at an upcoming SLSO on the go event. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all. Bye-bye. See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye-bye.